This week on Coronavirus Explained, we're discussing the so-called long haulers. That's people who haven't necessarily been hospitalised with COVID-19 or spent time on a ventilator in intensive care, but are nevertheless struggling to fully recover and experiencing recurring symptoms for weeks, even months after first falling ill. We're all familiar with the most common symptoms of COVID-19. Those with mild cases usually experience a fever, dry cough, loss of taste or smell, body aches and tiredness. Now officially they can expect to recover within two weeks on average. But longer term sufferers report a much wider range of symptoms, including debilitating fatigue, nausea, chest tightness, headaches, brain fog, gastrointestinal problems, memory loss, insomnia. It seems that the list goes on. And many are still suffering three, sometimes four months later, with no medical explanation, treatment or knowledge of when or even if they will be well again. Let's discuss this further. We are joined by Fiona Lowenstein, a New York founder of a COVID-19 support group. She fell ill on the 10th of March. Also, we have Professor Paul Garner, an epidemiologist from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. He's been experiencing COVID symptoms since the 19th of March. And Dr. Avindra Nath, neurologist from the US National Institutes of Health, joins us from Maryland. Good to see you all. Fiona, you were discharged from hospital and you thought you were recovering. It was all going to get better. What happened? Yes, I was discharged after my shortness of breath and fever seemed to go away. Um, and I got home and then I developed a whole new host of symptoms. So many of the things you mentioned, GI issues, dermatological issues, rashes, hives, sinus pain, sore throat, neurological and cognitive issues. Um, and this lasted between two and three months. And at this point, there really were not many of these stories kind of out in the news. So it was an extraordinarily isolating experience, both physically being confined to my room for, you know, the two or three weeks where I was thought to be contagious, but also socially because there was such widespread misunderstanding and lack of knowledge about this long recovery time and these lingering symptoms. I mean, Paul, you're an epidemiologist. You've had dengue fever and malaria. Do they even compare to what you've been through with COVID? This is far worse. And um, it is also more bizarre and uh, with unexpected turns and new symptoms and crazy things happening to you at every corner. It's a very frightening illness, even for people in infectious diseases. So Paul, with all of your knowledge, do you have any idea what's going on inside your body? Uh, I really don't. This, this, this virus is uh, really uh, unprecedented, is used so often. But for the first 12 weeks, like Fiona, I, I was really quite unwell. For the last um, four weeks, really, I, I, it has settled down to really what is uh, like a post-viral fatigue syndrome. And I'm finding the literature from um, chronic fatigue and, and ME very helpful in rehabilitating myself. So it, it's much more like a chronic fatigue uh, that some people see after viral infections. Avindra, I can see you nodding. Uh, that is your experience as well. That's what people have been telling you, those comparisons with chronic fatigue and ME. Yes, that is correct. There is a, there is a lot of overlap between the two syndromes. Uh, but they're not exactly the same. And so we are very interested in studying these patients to try and determine what the underlying pathophysiology might be. So, Vindra, what's your theory about why people are continuing to suffer with these symptoms? Well, of course, we don't really don't, do not know, uh, but there are several possibilities. Uh, one possibility is that there may be restricted viral replication ongoing so that small pieces of virus are still present there and they're driving an immune response. The second possibility is that maybe the virus is gone, but the immune system was cranked up uh, to such high levels that it hasn't really returned to baseline, and that's causing a lot of bystander damage in the body. Uh, the third possibility is that um, and there is some other unknown factor uh, that we do not quite understand. And so I think we um, are very eager to uh, bring these patients to the National Institutes of Health and uh, try to study them extensively. We have an ongoing study in MECFS, and so we have a lot of experience in uh, studying these patients 
and we'd like to apply the same technology to the uh, current uh, patient group. Fiona, for all of us, I guess it's um, difficult to, to think, really, that it's only been six months that this virus has even existed. There is still, as we're hearing, so much we don't know about it. Tell us about some of the experiences of the people in your support group and why you felt the need to set it up. Yeah, so I think that that question of the unknown is is a huge reason why, you know, community care and peer counseling is so important right now. When I first became sick, I was looking online for any information I could find about the virus, and it was very difficult to actually find detailed information about, you know, the average experience. Certainly, I saw information on people who had been hospitalized and had recovered, and I also saw somewhat misleading information that people, you know, my age, I'm 26, or people without pre-existing conditions really couldn't get very sick from this virus. Um, when I began sharing my story publicly, I started hearing from patients all over the world who wanted to, you know, they wanted basic questions answered, like when should I go to the hospital or what did they do for you there? But they also just wanted to connect on a personal level and receive emotional support because it can be so scary to live with, you know, uh, what you think is coronavirus. Um, and I think what we see in the group is there, there is a lot of mental health concern. Um, people are dealing with anxiety and depression. They're dealing with depression because they've been sick for a long time anxiety because they're afraid of what might come next. They're also dealing with long-term financial issues. Many of these patients were diagnosed as with mild cases initially, um, so they weren't initially able to access proper care or in some cases a, po a COVID test. And if you don't have a positive COVID-19 test result as I do, it's sometimes difficult to get you know friends, family, employers to take you seriously. And in certain cases, it can even be difficult to find a doctor who understands your experience. So I think the group has been incredibly crucial because you know there's that aspect of emotional support, but also because people are actually offering tangible advice on how to navigate medical bias, navigate the healthcare system, sharing, you know, lists of providers who really understand this issue and can be helpful. Um, so I think, you know, it's been a lifeline for me and, and I hear that from other people as well. So I'm very grateful for it. And my hope is that, you know, patients will continue to connect with one another and connect with scientists and doctors who are kind of on the same page. And we can begin to move this forward so that there's more attention on, you know, not just the question of mild and severe, but everything in, bet in between, which is what I think a lot of people are frankly experiencing. Okay, and Paul, the fact that many of you feel left out of the mainstream kind of medical narrative, that must also feel incredibly lonely at times. Uh, it, it does. I um, access and use and, and these groups I find helpful. And I think one of the important uh, things is that people actually do believe that what they're experiencing is actually happening. So uh, whilst, you know, some patients do, if some people do become anxious, actually the disease itself does mess with your head and muddle around with your mood. I also think that these self-help groups are incredibly important for people to start supporting each other with pacing. So one of the things that uh, the realization isn't really there, I, I, you know, I, further research is good, but we need stuff now. And I'm finding the ME chronic fatigue literature on appropriate pacing, finding out what my baseline of activity mentally and, and physically is, and not going over, over that, very helpful in stopping these busts, these but, sort of apparent relapses of the illness. So for in, sorry to interrupt you, Paul, but just as an example, did you have to have a rest or a sleep before you came up to do this interview with us. Uh, exactly. I was uh, lying down on my bed calmly uh, relaxing because I cannot get through the day without about four sleeps. Um, a, a relaxation, calm yourself down. And otherwise, I lose my speech. I can't speak properly, actually. And the tinnitus goes up. These are all um, symptoms associated with chronic fatigue. So it is very, very similar. And I appreciate we need research, but what we need now is also to use patient experience from chronic fatigue in the past to help advise people. Can I bring in Avindra now, and not to put you on the spot as our medical representative here, but why is the profession not listening? Why are some of these people being doubted and their symptoms being questioned, do you think? So I think the problem with the 
uh, medical profession is that you're limited by the testing that's available to you clinically. So a medical practitioner can investigate these patients and oftentimes they don't find anything uh, from the tests that are available to them. So they find themselves in a helpless position. So I think that's been the problem with MECFS. I think we believe the symptoms. We, um, we agree that patients are devastated. I mean, Dr. Garner and Dr. Fiona's stories are really um, a very, um, you know, moving. And I've talked to a lot of patients, uh, many of them healthcare workers themselves who were exposed in the New York and DC area to huge amounts of virus before all the um, masks and other things were available. So these people are very highly functioning individuals and all of a sudden their lives are just totally devastated. They're trying very hard to continue to practice medicine themselves and they can't really do it effectively. Okay, so I Fiona, don't think I just wanted to quickly ask you before we finish, Paul's main piece of advice is about rest. What would yours be for people who are still suffering briefly? I would say con connect with other patients um, because the, the resources are out there now. They're starting to, to come out. You know, as Paul said, um, members of, you know, the chronic fatigue community, and I would also say disability activists and chronic pain activists have been doing this work for decades. So there actually is a template for, you know, how to advocate yourself for yourself if you go to the doctor's office and how to deal with these symptoms. But a lot of it kind of requires you to connect with these networks and communities. Some of them have been in place for decades. Some of them are only coming up now. And I think, you know, the population of COVID patients and COVID survivors is only going to grow. So I would suggest, you know, reaching out, connecting with others, Certainly the body politics support group is, is open to anyone who thinks they might be experiencing the virus. Excellent also, advice. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we have to leave it there. Paul, Fiona, Avindra, a very important issue. Easy to forget how little we still know about COVID-19, but very good to hear your stories. Thank you.